My name's James Willis, uh, and I'm a uh, freelance sound engineer and also a musician. Right, yeah. fantastic. And where are people most likely to see you or know of you? Uh, in Worcester, um, probably at the Mars Bar. Um, um, I, uh, I work as a sound engineer there, probably doing two or three nights a week. Uh, and also, at the moment, playing in a band called The Cape of Good Hope. Some friends introduced me to all kinds of Britpop, like Blur and Cooler Shaker and uh, things like that. And that that immediately made me want to go out and sell my games console and buy a CD player and then start actually buying music. The first album I ever bought was um, was uh, Park Life by Blur. Uh, and uh, at the same time bought the Hey Dude single by Cooler Shaker. I went to see Cooler Shaker quite a few times as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely fantastic band. Like, just, they were probably one of the most exciting bands I saw live at that time as well. Just the whole show. Uh, the way they constructed the music live compared to the CD, just was, I thought it was amazing. My parents never really listened to music much. My dad listened to you before to a little bit, but um, no, I'd never really grew up with music. So it was kind of just someone played something to me and it was just for me. I never really knew music could be so exciting at the time. So something like when I first, when my friends first introduced me to all this kind of Britpop indie kind of stuff, it was just... I don't know, it was just, just hit me like a brick wall, it was a, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't know of any past music, I, re, I, I probably, you know, really didn't know the Beatles much or anything like that, I just really was shut off to music until the middle of high school. That's really quite surprising considering yeah. what you do now, isn't yeah. it? So what came after the Britpop thing? Was Oasis in part of this or not? Yeah, well, I was never a big Oasis fan, I think, that, um, I read Enemy a lot of the time and they kind of, made you either like Blur or Oasis, so I, I chose the Blur path on that. I found them more interesting than Oasis. I didn't want to watch television or it, it, everything else was boring. As soon as I started, I felt in control and uh, I felt creative. I never thought I was creative before that until I found music. I think I was terrible at art and, uh, and all sorts. And I, Yeah, I just felt creative. Did it become a sort of an obsession or...? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Music's always been an obsession ever since. Yeah, um, it was it was like the love of my life. It was really bad, you know. Um, girlfriends always came second to music, <laughs> definitely. About seventeen, we started going to gigs, more gigs, and seeing. Went to go and see like like I said, Cooler Shaker and Ash and uh, quite a few bands. But then we'd always get there early and there'd always be these support bands on and all these bands that people had never heard of and a lot of them would just... I remember seeing the one, uh, I think they were supporting Idlewild, called San Lorenzo and they're kind of from the air, they were from the area and it was just really... the way they structured their songs, there was no you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, it was... they just did whatever they wanted and uh, made... they didn't just stick within uh, normal melodies. It was discordant, and it was. It just. I just was really interested to watch, and then so then from then, I, I started to listen to stuff that was maybe a bit more alternative, things like Sonic Youth, uh, something a bit more edgy, and then after that, I I, I got into post rock, kind of instrumental rock stuff like Mogwai, Godspeed, uh, You Black Emperor, and. Um, uh, shellac and all sorts of things like that and since that that was the music that I really love so I would have loved ever since all that kind of music so describe that kind of music uh, so I, what what's going on in there that, that you love about I, it? I, yeah I find it I find it really I like it was really edgy but I think the main thing is they they're not writing me it feels like they're not writing music to make money they're writing music because that's just what feels right it, there, once you get to meet some of these people, you kind of realise that their, that their music is their personality. That it, they just let everything out. You can tell that you know that's them. It's just an extension of themselves. So really like albums that tell a story. It's like watching a film. You know, you have to listen to it from beginning to end, uh, rather than just oh yeah, I like three or four tracks on there are really great. But the rest is just all filler. What, what's it about the bands do that makes? That just goes. I love this. Whereas solo doesn't quite do it as much. 
Uh, I never really listen to words. I right. don't find myself recognising that listening to story. I listen to music more than anything. And I'll pick up on a melody of a song, probably a vocal melody, but if I listen to it enough, the words will penetrate to the point, but, but then I'll never, I'll never know what they actually mean. So sometimes I'll, I'll, be, I'll find a song that I listen to, but listen to, to for years, and I actually pay attention to the words for the first time, and just never realised it was about that, or, you know. So it's about soundscapes yeah. and things more than anything. And that's probably that why. Is yeah. that a link with the cinema stuff? The fact that you love movies as well, because most of the music you hear in oh, cinemas yeah. is not lyrics, is it? No, yeah, true. I, I think I've always thought uh, some of the greatest movies are made because of the soundtrack. And if you it wasn't say the soundtrack, there would be. Say my very first band that I properly joined was a band called Liquid Television at college. It's um, a good name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a, just like an indie rock three-piece band. I joined a band called Diego Garcia, um, which was. Uh, that was the music that I wanted to play. That was post-rock, instrumental, four-piece, two guitars, bass drums, me playing bass. That's some of the most fun I've had playing. playing did music. you make any headway? We did. We did. We were doing pretty well. Um, we were touring around the country, and we had a record label in Oxford that was a really a label that we really liked and kind of understood the music. Was ready to release our, our an album. YS and we went off and recorded it, uh, but then we kind of drifted apart a little bit. Just at the time you were recording an just album? As was, just as we were about to release an album on a record label. And it never got released? No. That is it. Have you still got the yeah, tapes yeah. and things? Yeah, yeah. You ever thought of like putting it out there? We've talked about it quite a bit. Yeah. Towards the end of that I started playing the Cape of Good Hope. And then um, the, uh, the drummer went off to America to do kind of touring in big bands in America and the one guitarist, he's in a band called Fuck Buttons now. Last borrowed because I've not been out for about 11 years now. I think it's 11 years. Yeah, so about 2001, something like that. And you're one of the earlier bands down there? Yeah, we're, uh, we probably played our first gig the year after I opened up. Metal's always seem to be a, a, a scene all on its own, from what I've seen. Would you? Yeah. What would you think of the Worcester scene? Where, how does it sort of coalesce and things? Yeah. It depends. It depends who's promoting. Because Crisis Promotions were putting on that night that was every week, and a couple of hundred people turning up every week. Everyone just wants to play metal because they knew that they'd get to play in front of all these people. So I guess it depends on the promoters and what kind of music they want to put on. I guess there's less of it because there's less metal promoters now. Right. Uh, you don't think there's less metal bands, you just think there's less metal promoters? I think there's less metal bands because there's less metal promoters. Right. Yeah, I think that's the way. There's there's far more uh, solo acts and acoustic acts than there were five, six years ago because there's so many people putting on open mic nights. Thing. It depends who's putting on shows or what they want to put on. People just want to play, so they'll play. A lot of the times when they're young, they'll play with whatever kind of music will get them a gig. I wasn't ever expected to make it as a famous musician, so I just wanted to be involved in what I wanted to do. And from high school, I decided that I wanted to become a sound engineer, a live sound engineer. I wanted to go on tour with bands. And I learned so much more by doing it. Than being how, how did you get that job at I started working. I started working behind the bar because they were looking for bar staff. I used to go down to the jam night every Wednesday, um, and uh, so I got so I got a job behind the bar. And uh, Brian realised I was doing I was studying music technology, so he offered me some uh, some training, or I would just kind of shadow the engineers that were there at the time. And then I started filling in a few shifts and it just progressed from there. Yeah. That sounds very supportive of Brian to just do does, that with one of his bar staff, wouldn't it? It does that a lot. We, we, get, we get a lot of people come in. All, all the engineers we have have, have have always been trained up. I love my work. Uh, I think I've got the best job in the world. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And uh, I don't often go home thinking that was the rest of the time. Right. But it does happen. The whole joy of sound engineering is producing a great sound. So. If they're great musicians, uh, it's my job just feels so easy. Um, to, to produce this just this great sound that 
I, I, I prefer sound engineering to playing. I like to kind of stand at the back and not be noticed. Uh, I think with sound engineering, sometimes you're, when you're at your best is when no one notices you're there. If you notice the sound engineer, there's probably something wrong if you're having to turn around all the time. Because if the sound's great, you're just into the night and you forget that there's a sound engineer. Put us in your ears and you're going, I've, I've got this now. What, what are you hearing? What am I hearing? Yeah. Okay, well, I think the most important member of the band is the drummer. Uh, closely followed by the bass player. I think you can have the best guitarist in the world, the best keyboard player, the best singer. But if the drummer and the bass player aren't very good, the band sounds terrible. But on the, on the flip side of that, I've seen bands where the drummer's been really great, the bass player's been really great, but the, the, the other people aren't as technically gifted, but they still sound like a great band. It's all about how tight the sound is, you know, um, uh, how, and also how great, how good the equipment is that they use makes a big difference, you know. Um, one of the things I learned at college was you uh, can't polish a turd. <laughs> I was describe it's if the band's really tight, you know, if they, if you can you can tell when the band's been playing together for a long time. It's just becoming natural to them. They don't have to be paying attention to the drummer to keep in time. They just know. It just all clicks into place. And then what I've got to do is create a nice balance between the low end and the, the high end and the mid range, and then make sure I fit every instrument in all those places so everything can be clear and heard and then it's just it's an exceptionally quiet vocalist with a really loud drummer. Uh, what a lot of people don't know, especially like on the Mars Bar, it can be quite a narrow stage. The singer's very quiet and the, the drummer's bashing away at his cymbals. Every time you turn that vocal up, you're making the drummer twice as loud. So you're never, ever going to hear it. So it is a technical thing. Yeah, yeah. So how do people, uh, so what's, so when people like some of the loudest bands in the world go out, like the Who, or um, like David Black Sabbath, or Ozzy Osbourne, you always hear Ozzy Osbourne, yeah, it's yeah. fantastic or something, or Led Zeppelin, the Robert Plant. What do they do? Cause, uh, well, a lot they, of the times the stages are bigger, so the drummer's right. further away. Okay. Uh, choice of microphone as well. Different microphones will help hear less sound on stage. Yeah. So it sounds like stage size is crucial. Stage size 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 can make a big difference. Yeah. I find music really regional. And I think a lot of the I think a lot of the bands that make it in the UK, a lot most of them sound like they're from London. I think that's because most of them are from London. Um, so so they have their own sound around that area. And what else they also have is lots of record companies. So they have lots of opportunity. Um, you obviously get bands that sound like they're from Manchester, bands that sound like from Liverpool. They've got a lot of musical heritage there. And they still have a few record companies around that area there. And I think in Worcester, Worcestershire, we kind of have our own sound as well. In the Birmingham area, and just, just kind of like the Midlands kind of area. But we don't really have any record companies. There's no one really to pick up and promote this sound to the rest of the UK.